You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. So we're talking about this Greek word, euangelion. It means good news. And tucked into that word, as I've said before, is this little Easter egg of um, another word, angelos. Angelos, angels, messenger of God. When you look and unpack euangelion, good news, there's also hidden in it a messenger. And we're seeing how um, the interplay between God's messengers, the coming about of the good news, the gospel has come into this world. And it's exciting to know that God is at work um, and he does it on his terms, not ours that his ideas are bigger and more robust than ours. And we find ourselves excitedly engaging in what God's doing in this place. Not only this place, but our friends out at Foundry West, our friends at the church globally, all around this world, worshiping God and understanding this, that the good news is Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. And we're gonna unpack and work through today what it means when it says that he will save. What does it mean when God makes the announcement that he will save? One of the realities that I've found is there are moments where you can speak just the right words. There are moments where you can really fumble that opportunity as well. But there are moments where you can speak just the right words. On the 18th of June, 1940, a rotund, heavy drinking, cigar smoking British man crawled behind the lectern at the English parliament. Winston Churchill, he is way up there on my list of really awesome leaders in the history of the world. Probably not the best person, but the guy could lead. And he stood up before the British Empire and he announced realities none of them wanted to face. He named names they were tired of hearing. And he said, Hitler's armies have defeated the French army and the continent is now under the rule of the Nazi Third Reich. And the battle for Britain has surely begun. The day will come when those forces attempt to take our island and we will fight on the streets and we will fight on the landing grounds. And you can feel the momentum begin to build because this guy who didn't look like more than that he could carry much more than a gin to breakfast is suddenly carrying the English empire on his back. And he said to him, what, let us brace ourselves to our duty. Let us brace ourselves to our duty and our opportunity because in the thousand years to come, they will say of us in this moment, that was their finest hour. How do you repackage that into Christmas? I don't know, but he did. He told the British people, we're about to be remembered. We're about to shine brightest in this dark moment. And we are going to brace ourselves not to our wanton desires, not to our lazy impulses, not to our own separate individual dreams. We are going to brace ourselves to duty, king and country. And we will fight not just for the freedom of this island, but for the freedom of America, for the freedom of the whole world. We will stand as the stopgap between the Nazi empire and the rest of the world. And everybody went, okay. And the unlikeliest thing happened. The German army broke for the first time over the breakwaters of England. The right words at the right hour matter. And we need to know that it is no different. God has been using the right words at the right hours for thousands of years. And today we get to see and experience God having one of those moments where it feels like it echoes in the halls of history like Churchill's moment. But this moment for God is announcing something far greater. He will save. You can follow along as we read this text. Matthew 1, 18 to 25 says it this way. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to marry Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because her husband was faithful to the law, And yet he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, which means he thought about it for a long time, he came to a decision. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Does anybody else remember like somebody named Joseph having dreams? Like, don't you love when scripture's like bong, echo, echo. I just love that. So 
You don't have to love it. I do. All right. Um, so he comes to him and he says, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. You are to name him Jesus because he will save them from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Joseph, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate or have a moment of intimacy with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. I wanna to talk to you about one of those nights. I don't know if you've ever had it, but I can tell you this, because I've had it. I know for a fact that Joseph went to bed that night with a knot somewhere between here and here, and it was it's something of indigestion or heartache. He couldn't probably figure it out. He probably felt sick. He probably didn't eat. He was wondering what was next because, well, Joseph went to bed thinking that sin had ruined his future. Sin had ruined everything he had planned. Imagine Joseph laying down that night after Mary says, I'm, I'm pregnant. An angel visited me and told me I was gonna have this child. I haven't been with anybody else. And he goes, okay, good enough. And he goes and thinks about it. And he goes to bed that night heartbroken. He goes to bed that night preemptively embarrassed for what's gonna come. He's probably super ticked off. He's probably legitimately angry. All his future plans are like feathers in a tornado. They're gonna go all out the window and in the end, there's no way to get them all back. His future is inalterably changed. It is completely up in the air. And now he lays lonely on a bed, sleepless, wondering what's next. And the, and the feeling of betrayal begins to haunt his soul. Have you ever had that night? Have you ever laid on a bed late at night, not able to sleep with the tears just rolling down? You realize the next morning, the chalky white salt next to where your head lay was your tears dripping off your ears or your cheeks onto the pillow and you just laid there and grieved what had been lost. Have you had that night too? I think it's important to note that Jesus' earthly father had that night. He had one of those nights where the future seemed lost and he was a good man. A good person isn't exempt from the heartaches of this world. He was a good man. It says that Joseph made a resolution in his mind, which means this. He wrestled with the reality of sin in his mind. He wrestled with what Mary had done, because honestly, your teenage daughter or girlfriend shows up and says the news, I'm carrying a baby. Don't worry, never been with anybody. It's an, an angel told me it's the Lord's child. What are you gonna do, right? I mean, let's just be honest. Let's scrub this down. You're gonna be like, oh, okay, Mary. <laughs> Seriously, this is okay. But I want you to look at who God chose to raise his son. I want you to look at the traits of Joseph's character from the beginning. He embodied justice and mercy. It says this, he loved the law. He loved God's counsel and scripture, his commandments. And he knew that he had to separate from her because it would violate the law for him to stay in a married relationship with someone who was sinfully adulterous. They would have been considered married at this point, though not officially. So her affair that got her pregnant in his mind would have been adultery, a sin and he would have to divorce her. He would have to do it. But that, so there's the justice. There's justice under the law, which he loved. But then there's also mercy. He intended, I don't know, I love this glimpse. He intended to show mercy and to let her go quietly, to let her just go on with her life. He wasn't gonna pull her out into the village square, publicly shame her and denounce her and walk away from her as an unfaithful woman. He would quietly break off the engagement. He would quietly move forward because she was a sinner now. Joseph shows us a glimpse of the heart of a loving, just, and merciful God. He was a good man. He was a good man. And I think it's important that we note that. How often... 
do we see either of these traits, justice or mercy, in our lives? In our lives, they're traits of God. God is infinitely just. He is infinitely merciful. How often do we see justice and mercy at work in our own lives? Let alone, how often do we see them in unity, working together in our lives? Is anybody here super just and merciful? If you raise your hand, you need a humility class, but that's okay, right? It's hard to be just and merciful. It's hard to see them playing together. More often or not, we are selfish, we are lazy, we are devoted and dependent on what people think of us, and we work for it. Erica and I have a lot of fun in life, but when you're close with somebody, they can say things that get through all the thick armor in your life and kind of pierce, and you're like, that is too accurate, right? If you're, if you're married or in a relationship, you, you know this, a best friend, they can do that. And it's not because they don't love you, it's because they speak truth. One of the truths Eric spo- Erica spoke to me as a young father is um, she coined a phrase, that revealed a lazy streak in me. She called it charenting. Yeah, right, all the men are like, boo, boo, (laughs) not good. Here's the problem, that thing was so laser focused, I was like, it's true, there's no argument. (laughs) But I am defiant in the face of your truth, right? Because I would sit there and I'd be like, knock it off! Broncos are losing to the Browns, you know, like that, that's going on in my life, right? So I would chair it. I'd be like, hey, stop, get over here, get in here, get, get in, sit right, no, no, don't sit down, stand in front of me. What are you guys doing? Like a king on a throne before his subjects, I would chair the people with justice and a firm rule. Charenting, the laziest attribute of a bad parent, of which... I fight and am guilty of way too often. I hate the term and live, in it to, live into it too often. There's a laziness. There's a self-centeredness in our culture where I see parents leaning so heavily on their children and having them do things that the parents should be doing because while the parents, my generation, Gen X, Well, maybe we were a little too indulged. You say, what about the millennials? I don't want to talk about them. I'm talking about us. We lean on our kids to do things we don't want to do. And we're selfish. Our ambitions are for us and we don't look to our children, our friends, our community at times. We think me, 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 I, I, I. And we're selfish and self-centered and demanding. I think that is across the spectrum of all generations. I'll just talk about my own. And then I look at those of us who are dependent on the favorable ratings and the approval of other people. We live under that yoke of slavery of will I be liked? Will I be loved? Am I worth remembering? I think it's important to note all of us are replaceable. And I'm not saying that from a scientific place. I'm saying it from a historical place. Literally, we'll all be replaced on this earth. Our children or the next generation will come up behind us and bury us as we pass on and they will leave a mark. The question is, what do we do in our time, in our place, in our moment? If we don't live a life that that, um, reveals part of the nature of God like Joseph did, we're missing our opportunity as the church to live in justice and in mercy. Because here's what happened that dark night where Joseph laid down and was a good man and found justice and mercy at work in his heart. How do I reconcile her actions with what I want to do? Because deep down, he still loved her. He probably wanted the best for her, but he was betrayed. He was hurt. What did he do? He did nothing but receive a message of hope. I want you to pay attention to me, what the angel of God said to him. Because Joseph went to bed thinking, I'm kind of a loser. I've been cheated on. I've been betrayed. Now she thinks I'm dumber than a post because she thinks that's God's baby. And she thinks I'm going to buy that mess. No, thank you. He goes to bed with this identity that says, oh, I've been betrayed. I've been shamed. What is the first thing the angel says to him? Joseph, son of David. He calls him back into a deeper identity. He calls him back into an identity that is rooted intentionally by God and the roots hold even in this dark circumstance. 
I think that's very important that we understand that. That he says to him, Joseph, son of David, what he's doing is calling him back to a better name. He's not a loser. He's a son, a descendant of the great king of Israel. And that matters in God's story. He's reframing his identity. He says, Joseph, don't, son of David, don't be afraid. Don't let your fears own the narrative. He gets his attention by calling him back to a better identity and reminding him that there's someone bigger than he is controlling things in this world, guiding the story of good news to come about. And then the angel says this, he will save the people from their sins. Do you realize the angel appeared to Zechariah and to Mary and to Joseph, but he never says that to anyone but Joseph. Joseph is the only one who finds out the true nature and identity of who this child will be. He will be the redeemer. He will be the one who saves them from their sins. And that for you and for me should mean a lot. Because if your life is as riddled with selfish, lazy, self-dependent sin as mine is, you need a savior. And so did Joseph. He needed a savior and he needed to know that God had an answer. We can't take sin lightly in our lives, in this church, in this world. It must be dealt with because God takes sin seriously. And we see that in the person of Jesus Christ because sin is the thing that ruins lives. It destroys relationships. This child was going to save people from their sins, rescue them from a death sentence. The question is, how? How would this baby go about this? And I love that the nature and the identity of Jesus was bound to his redemptive nature and work. What he would be is what mattered. He would be the son of God who redeemed us. Joseph understood how sin separates on a personal granular level that night. He understood that his marriage was lost, his future was cashed in, and he was probably gonna be a little bit more of a bachelor because now he had a really bad story of why relationships don't work out. Joseph knew how sin separates, devastates, and hurts. Almost, it's almost like God put somebody over Jesus as a father figure who understood what God the Father had gone through and the separation, the hurt, and the devastation of people from him by sin. And Jesus will fix this. The angel is telling him, Jesus will fix this. He will forgive and save people from their sins. When we hold on to that kind of truth, when we get into that kind of gravity, something that doesn't let us excuse our sin, but allows us to face it, well, we can look to Jesus, who is God's display of perfect justice and mercy. Joseph is like a, like a three-second trailer to the eternity of God's justice and mercy. Joseph gives us a glimpse, a brief flash of what it looks like when God has justice and mercy written on his heart. Joseph embodies these things on a small, small scale. And Jesus will be the full, perfect display of God's justice and mercy. Jesus was and is the answer for everything. He was and remains the answer for everything that haunts us, that shames us, that broke us, Jesus Christ is the answer. It doesn't mean we don't live without scars and pain. It means within those scars and pain is the purpose of Almighty God to redeem it in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We live with this hope and this tension because Joseph, who planned to show justice and mercy to Mary, would see, well, in God's eyes, sin must be punished. There must be justice, equal justice under the law. You and I all want justice for sin, right? And you're like, not me, Eric. I'm so compassionate. Yeah, let me back into your car in the parking lot and you'll be like, hello, Frankenmuth Insurance. I would like to report an ungodly pastor for backing into my car. You would want justice like that. You and I don't wanna go to heaven where Adolf Hitler's sins aren't dealt with, where he walks around with his arrogant little mustache banging and beating on the people of God and being hateful and horrible because you don't have to deal with sin. It's no big deal, right? There's no punishment. Wrong. 
there is punishment. There is punishment for sin. Justice requires that sin be dealt with and it be dealt with once and for all. And that's where we find the person of Christ being the most merciful of all in this world. In Christ alone, we see the mercy of God. In Christ alone, we see the mercy of God. We see the true costly nature of grace, of love, of relationship that goes beyond how we feel and goes deeper into who we are. As the church, we see in Jesus Christ this this need, not only for justice to be found, but to be received in mercy because we're all deserving of hell and death apart from Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, we realize there is no other way. There is no other way on this earth, the earth to come, the life, anything around us. This is it. The gospel, the good news is singular in, around, and embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. And we as the church understand that the penalty for sin under the law of justice was death and that Christ died it. He died your death and my death. And that promise to Joseph rings so loud and clear, he will save them from their sins. It rings so loud and clear in the eyes, the ears, and the hearts of those of us who've been forgiven much, right? Have you been forgiven like I have? Like there's no way I should be a pastor. Just no way. Maybe I should be like on a fishing boat. Like, you know, like, no, I'm not joking. Like way out in the middle of the ocean with no fish or no people and just let me drift into oblivion. I'm not a good person. I'm not saying I indulge my my brokenness, but I will tell you this. I know my sins. I know what's under the blood of Jesus Christ. And that grace isn't cheap. That grace cost God everything. It cost Christ on the cross. When we talk about sin, we must talk about Jesus bearing it. That in him alone is the redemption of our lives. Because you and I are just pure and simple jacked up folks who really need Jesus. And Jesus' death allows us to receive God in mercy. He comes to us in mercy. He doesn't come bearing what we deserve. He comes like he did to Joseph. Don't be afraid. There's a remedy for these sins. And it's found only in the person of Christ. Someone had to answer for these sins and Christ answered. Christ answered. He was put out on that isolated, lonely fishing boat in the middle of nowhere. He was separated from the living and his father on the cross and he died our death so that in mercy we could be received. Even though we don't deserve it, even though we cheapen grace and just say, I'll just pray for forgiveness later. That's not how it works. This matters. When we look at it as a church, it matters. So we call ourselves to obedience now. The calling to you is to obedience. It will always be for you and I, obedience. And if you look at obedience as held against pride, which pride is the very first sin of all, Adam and Eve in the garden, and they saw the fruit as desirable. Why? Because it made them like God, exalted them. Obedience is the hardest thing in the world for someone, well, let's say like me, I don't like obedience. I like independent obedience of myself. Yeah, that's what I like. Actually, I super just dawned on that. Um, I like that. I like obeying Eric's whims, desires, and wants. I like that. And it's everything that's wrong with me, with you. So let's deal with obedience since God is perfectly just and merciful. Since Jesus saves and we do not, we can trust in God. And when, we, when he speaks like he did to Joseph, we can obey and we can do what Joseph did when he woke up. He obeyed the angel of the Lord and he took Mary into his life. And I want you to think of the cost of that. He had to worry now about what the neighbors would say because he loved Mary most And he didn't even believe her. How's the neighbor, like, you know, whoever they were, the Ishmaelites or something, (laughs) next door to them are like, okay, yeah, you guys were never together. He had to now take her into his home and deal with the reputation, the smudge on his name to be obedient to God. 
He had to deal with the looks and the things that um, neighbors said behind their back, but never to their face. The passive aggressive, cutting, hurting things. And he didn't worry about who would think he was disobeying God's law. He worried only about obeying God. He worried more about God than the people. And he didn't care that it would shame him, or at least he didn't care enough to disobey. He leaned in time and again. He heard from a messenger of God that obedience mattered in this situation. And it matters to you and I the same. I said it last week, you live under a calling. You live under an anointing of the Holy Spirit that fills you, equips you and gifts you. Will you obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit in the big and the little things? He obeyed. Joseph obeyed. For you and I, that's what it comes down to. Seeking the approval of God over and against the approval of our initial desires, the approval of our selfish wants, and the approval of the world around us. We can have those things or we can walk closely with God. We cannot have them both. They stand opposed to one another. They stand opposed to one another. And we can't live under the judgmental eye of ill-informed, angry people who want to see us fall so they feel better. Don't bind yourself to their approval. Bind yourself to the approval of one. Because in Joseph's life, he gave us an example of justice and mercy. He showed us that we can do our best to live right. But for, don't forget, he was, quite, he was probably really seeking God, really seeking after God of what to do with Mary. And his intention was to divorce her to walk away and do nothing. And God intervened and said, wait, wait. When God speaks, we must obey, even against our better judgments at times. Because we know this, that in order for the church to truly be the church, we have to obey in costly ways. We have to stop saying we're sorry that we want you to connect in the word of God daily, apart from this worship setting. I'm not sorry for that. I want you in the word of God. I fully expect that our church is reading the word of God in the devotions that we provide, also getting into groups and obeying the clarion call of this church to be in relationship, in worship, and the word of God for the transformation of our lives into Christ's image. We can't pretend that the word isn't clear for us. We must own up to who we are. We must own up to the fact that if Jesus is who the angel announced to Joseph, the one who will save us from our sins, our past cannot continue to dictate to us our future. We have to believe that our past is securely redeemed in Christ Jesus. And there's nothing you could do that he wouldn't forgive. The question is, will you give it to him? Will you open your hands and walk away? from your identity, from your desires, and obey him so that, just like last week, you can bear the Son of God forward into this world. When I think about the goodness of God in this story, that he understood how heartbroken Joseph was, that he gave his son such a good mentor who would live into justice and mercy, I think of the church and I think, may we be men and women like Joseph. May we obey God even when the world disagrees. May we obey God and love him more than we love their approval. And may we never be bound to seeking fame or the outside influence, but trusting that God has called us to one thing, to make known the name of him who we first love. We love Jesus. We know Jesus. He is our Lord, our Savior, and our purpose. And once we get that straight, we begin to live with a clarity that becomes merciful and gracious to the world around us. Don't ever forget that the goodness of God bought us out of our own bonds of slavery and into his life. May the goodness of God rest heavy on you. May the mercy of God remind you that in Christ you are forgiven, but may the justice of God also speak loudly that there are those who don't yet know and you, you, church, your messengers in our day and age. And we can't forget what we're called to. Amen? Amen? Lord Jesus Christ, 
we as your church step back and just confess you are good. We confess you are faithful and we love you and we trust you. And so Lord, in that love and that trust, we quiet ourselves for just a moment and remember back to the things you've called us to maybe years ago in our childhood that maybe we didn't do because we wanted a different life. Maybe the little obediences we didn't live into just this past week. And we ask for courage, for the courage of Joseph to be able to obey. God, even if we can't do anything well, may we do it obediently. May we be obedient to your Spirit's call. Because your goodness has called us out of darkness into light. We are blessed. We are called. We're anointed for your purposes. So in that blessing, in that calling, in that gift of anointing, may we, your church, live obediently. And may we mirror the heart of God for this world in the lives we lead. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. You know, there's, um, there's moments we speak to culture and there's moments where you're just kind of yourself. I think of the story of Winston Churchill getting on an elevator and he was a little bit inebriated and a woman was mad at him. She said, Winston, you're, you're drunk. And he said, yes, but you're ugly and in the morning I'll be sober. It was a horror. And to me, I'm like, I love Winston Churchill. But notice this, that's not the tone he took when everything hung in the balance. There was a different tone. There wasn't frivolity. And people will say to me, Where, are you grumpy today, Eric? Are, are you No, but everything hangs in the balance for us when we are people who make culture by the spirit that lives in us. Make no mistake, what we do here is not for Sunday. It is to change the world. And let us know our calling is high. It is clear and it is ours now. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, now. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. You are called, you are anointed, you are purposeful. Quit living in the echoes of your past and grab onto your future because it's God's future through you. God is bringing the son of God to bear through your life. Don't waste it on the approval of others, the selfish desires and the lazy mentalities. Be a Christian grounded in the word of God, connected to the body of Christ and doing what we just did, declaring God's goodness regardless of the circumstances right now. Right now is our moment and we get to make culture. We get to tell the world it doesn't own the culture. God does. The world doesn't own its people. God does. And we are going to be the ones who step out boldly into a future he's got planned. And in his justice and his mercy, we will see the kingdom of God come through us. Amen? Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace as you go about this work being the living gospel in this world. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.